remember talking with, with Damon about it when I was first setting up the company. And, you know, people from Damon's era, the Eddie Irvines, the, the Johnny Herberts, those guys, they literally went from zero exposure to media to boom, you're in Formula One. Yeah. And nobody, you know, Damon said, nobody ever told me, nobody's ever taught me how to do an interview. I just kind of had to make it up as I went along. And, and it, you know, it's become a far more important thing now, not just for people in motorsport, but for all sports people, all, all athletes to be far more savvy on the communication side, the media, the marketing, the sponsors, you know, how to, you know, deal with when sponsors have got, you know, groups of people they've got to interact with and all of this kind of thing. It's just part of your job as a professional athlete. Hi, welcome to Unapologetically You with myself, Tulse, and I am so excited to bring you our next guest, Louise Goodman. She is an award-winning TV presenter and journalist with over 20 years of media experience. Her childhood interest in motorsport was first sparked by the exploits of James Hunt, and she's gone on to build a very successful career in this male-dominated and highly competitive arena. She was actually dubbed the first woman of Formula One, and Louise made her name as part of ITV's Grand Prix presentation team, and she is currently co-presenting the channel's live coverage of the British Touring Car Championships. But her skills extend way beyond reporting from the pit lane. She is not only a talented presenter across the board, she's also fronted a wide range of TV shows and her journalistic experience has been put to good use by contributing to radio stations, writing for newspapers and magazines. She is informative, entertaining and she is kept in demand. She also hosts conferences, live events and award ceremonies. Louise is also handy behind the wheel. She's mixed in with the best in cars and on the racetrack. She's even finished a highly creditable third in the class of the British round of the 1999 World Rally Championships. And she became the first woman to ever take part in a Formula One pit stop during the 2006 British Grand Prix. I am so excited for you to hear about Louise's background, how she got into the world of presenting in Formula One, and also some key stories and what are the other presenters like too, as well as what is going on with her right now in the world of media. So stay tuned and I hope you enjoy listening to this podcast. Remember, if you're not already, we do have our Patreon page. If you would like to support us on Unapologetically You, the link for the Patreon page is below. So we would love to have you as our community members there. And sit back, enjoy this podcast with Louise Goodman. Good, thank you. Welcome to Unapologetically You. And I get the pleasure to interview you all by myself. So Kelly's off sleeping as she's in Australian time zone right now. So thank you, Kelly. (laughs) Lucky Kelly, yeah. So I will have the pleasure of interviewing you today. And I wanted to firstly, actually, for those people who don't know about you and your background, Tell us a little bit about how you began your career in presenting and what was your journey like before F1? Well, before F1, I, when, I left, um, when I left college, um, I couldn't see the point of going to university because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do as a career. Um, so, and I think back then, back in the day, it was a while ago, university tended to be a lot more vocational you know there, there weren't there weren't as many degree courses as there are now uh, you know journalism which is what I ended up doing you didn't go to university to study that you got a job on a local paper or magazine or something like that so that's what I ended up doing I started um I had a brief foray into the secretariat well which I knew I didn't want to do but it was a means to an end and earning some money and then then got a job on a on a powerboat racing magazine so that was really my, my entree into 
the world of, of journalism. Through that, I met a guy called Tony Jardine, who had worked for a PR company that did quite a lot of work in, in motorsport and Formula One. Tony was just setting up his own company. He was looking for somebody to come and work with him. I was looking for a sort of a, an easier job because by this point I was editing the magazine and I was planning to go off traveling. So I wanted just an easy job for a, you know, a few months so that I could get some evening work as well to, to bolster my funds to go traveling. So, so I went to work for Tony for three months. Um, and that really was my entree into the world of motorsport. One of our first clients was, was Camel Cigarettes who were just starting their sponsorship of the Lotus Formula One team. So we're talking about like back in the 1980s here. Um, so, and that really was, was my entree into, as I say, into the world of motorsport. Went off all my travels. I actually met up with Tony at the Australian Grand Prix and worked with him in, in Adelaide that year at the Grand Prix. Um, which was quite bizarre. I was traveling around on the, on the back of a mate's motorbike, you know, turned up in Adelaide. Suddenly there I am in the Formula One paddock. Then I jumped off on the motorbike and off I went again. But Tony said, when you get back to the UK, let me know. Um, so, so I did. And, and I started working for him again. And, um, and as I say, he had a lot of clients in, in motorsport. So through that, I became the press officer for the, for the Leighton House Formula One team. That's actually a Leighton House car you can see behind oh. me. Little Miami blue it was called the colors of it um and then from there I went to work for the the Jordan Formula One team so that was in the early 1990s and it was while I was at Jordan that I was approached by uh, well it wasn't initially it was by there were various different ITV was taking over the contract from the BBC to show Formula One there were various different production companies that were putting forward bids to actually get the production contract to make the the, the program for ITV so I was approached by, by, by one of those um, consortiums um, and it, it was the one that, that won the gig. So, so it was, I was presented with a sort of concept of would you like to do this before the job was actually available. And the perceived wisdom at the time, it, it was going to be a different, um, a different production company that was going to get the gig. So, so I was sort of quite surprised when it came through that Mac won. Um, was was the the consortium of Meridian Anglia, two of the ITV regional stations, and, and Chrysalis. Um, so yeah, so that's when it sort of became a oh my god, you know, I, I hadn't really done any television work at that stage. I'd done a little bit as the Jordan press officer. I'd done a few reports from the um, Jordan Garage for RTE, which is the uh, Irish broadcaster. Mm -hmm. But I had no training whatsoever in in presenting or broadcasting. So I just they kind of gave me a microphone and said, off you go. So I, I sort of I, they didn't employ me for my my broadcasting expertise. They employed me for my for my knowledge of the sport. I knew I knew the people in the paddock. I knew the drivers. I, I knew the sports. So I knew what to ask. And I think importantly as well, I knew when to ask it. Yeah. So um, so that was why I was employed to do the job. So. The ITV knew about making television programs. They either took somebody who knew about motorsport and taught them about TV, or they took somebody who, who knew about TV and taught them about motorsport. And luckily for me, they decided to go the uh, the, the, the former route. So um, it was it really was in at the deep end. I mean, it was so scary the first race I did. But and every now and then, Bradley Lord, who you will know, who's yeah. the head of communications for the for the Mercedes team. He, he regularly reminds me, I remember watching your first, and I'm thinking, no, don't remind me, Bradley, because it was just so dreadful. I, I really didn't know what I was doing. Thankfully, the drivers were all very kind, very gentle, because they'd seen me around the paddock for years at this point. Yeah. So they were all very good with me, very, you know, gave me good answers to terrible questions or terribly, you know, posed questions. And um, and I, you know, I just squeak a little voice, because I was so, you know, I was just so nervous. And, and back in the day, you know, there were a lot less TV stations around then. So we were broadcasting to six, seven, eight million people. You know, it, mm. it's quite daunting when you think you're, you're learning on the job with, with six million people watching you. And how did you overcome that fear? Like sometimes I think some when you're in front of people and you've got all eyes on you, that fear can kind of be debilitating. But if as soon as you hone into the moment and your own interaction with the driver or with the person, you kind of forget that there's cameras around you. Is that one way of how you dealt with your role? Yeah, I, I had to, I think I had to, first and foremost, and it made a big difference, I had a lot of support from my boss at the time, Neil Duncanson, and everybody else on the crew. You know, James Allen was the other pit lane reporter. 
James would be helpful and say, if you ask a question this way and, you know, all, all of this kind of stuff. So I was also working with Martin Brundle. Now, Martin and I had worked together at Jordan. He was our driver oh. in, in my last year as their press officer and his last year as a Formula One driver. So again, and Martin, actually, because we, we both come from working for a team and stepped into this world of telly and you know what it's like when you work for a racing team you're very much just with that team you don't go into any other garages you don't go into any other motor home. so I felt like I didn't have a home in the paddock anymore and mm. I didn't really understand my new world in the television compound so you know but I just had to I'd, I'd come home from the races and you know cry and think oh my god I can't do this but I'm really I'm, I'm quite a determined person. I don't like, you know, being told I can't do something, basically. So I thought, yeah. sod that. I'll, I'm just going to have to learn. Woman up. Get on with it. You know. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, just just gradually got a bit more relaxed about it. And, and you know, and there were times when, you know, I can remember at the end of the first year, there was a big party and a semi-inebriated mechanic came up to me and said, oh, you're that girl off the telly, aren't you? And I'm thinking, you know damn well I am. And he said, oh, my wife doesn't like you. She says you're rubbish. She turns you down every time. And I just, by that point, I just, because I'd literally just come from a teen dinner and, you know, my boss had been really praising it, everybody, and had said to me, oh, God, you come on so much. And I just thought, oh, sod you. Hmm. You know, don't care what you think. My boss likes what I do. So, um, so yeah, yeah I, th I think just the determination to, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not very good at not being very good at things. So I try hard to, to get good at them. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm the same when it comes to having that level of determination. And it's a bit of it's resilience, isn't it? It's kind of yeah, and I, left it off and your I shoulders. Learning not to be self-conscious as well. You know, silly yeah. little things. Like I've been walking around the paddock looking like something the cat dragged in for years because I didn't, you know, it didn't matter if I hadn't done my hair if I'd had a skin full the night before and was wearing sunglasses and no matter you know it didn't matter. so I was suddenly terribly self-conscious and also back in the day you know clothing wise there were so few women on the team we just got given the boys uniform so yeah. you look like a you know like a bag of spanners every time you stepped into the paddock there was no, nothing elegant or, or ladylike about it at all um and suddenly I'm, you know, having to dress and do my hair and, and I was terribly self-conscious that people would be thinking, oh, look at her, you know, now she's on the, you know, late. And, and in the end, I just thought, you know what, it, it doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what people who are looking at you think. It matters about doing a good job and it matters whether you're, you know, comfortable that you're doing your best and getting the best. So you just learn to, to block everything out and, and actually think, you know, A, probably nobody was thinking hmm. look at her it was my self-consciousness that that made me think that rather than rather than anybody sort of immediately around me in the paddock but as I say you just kind of look at the end game rather than getting too concerned about what's going on around you think about the end game think about you know what are you what are you trying to do here what are you trying to produce you, you want to look professional you want to look the part you want to look so um yeah it's just getting getting your head around it when you when you're stepping and, you know, it was a giant leap into this whole new world. So it took me a while to get my head around it. Um, but yeah, that was, when was that? 90, I can't even think when it was, 90, 97 was our first year. So, you know, it's oh, over 20 okay. years ago now. So, yeah. 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 And that's the thing. It's like, I like the way you said about looking at the end goal. Like sometimes you have these little comments and those uh, the things that can kind of chip away at your ego, but you need to kind of build that level of, like I said before, resilience, self-confidence, and just look at the end game, look at where you want to be going rather than being um, knocked by the ped pebbles that's, you know, kind of knocking you down. Yeah, um, and I, I have to say, I'm very glad, you know, I, I did my learning, in, you know, before social media was even a thing, because I think it must be very difficult for anybody now to you know ignore all of that comic because it's in your face it's on your phone and we're all you know looking at our phones the whole time so yeah. um and everybody has an opinion yeah which they can everybody probably did have an opinion beforehand but now they can float their opinion out there without really much thought about who it might hurt or that you know the the um the downside of expressing opinions um so yeah that i think that was the that was a good thing 
Yeah, for sure. And and so when you began in Formula One, there was very much, a, even though it's only in the last couple of years, there there have been no grid girls. But back in the day, it was more women were probably more glorified or looked at as icons. There were grid girls on the grid. There weren't that many women working in Formula One. So how did you feel about, you know, working with a bunch of boys and, and being the only female in that environment, like how did that affect um, your job? I didn't, I've always been a bit of a tomboy. I'm also five foot 10 and opinionated, which I think helps because, and, and I do have a stare that can, you know, so, so um, I, I'm often told people find me scary, which possibly is a useful attribute when you're in that kind of situation. But I was very determined when I first arrived um, working with the Leighton House team, well, I say I was very determined. I was partly a bit scared because there weren't that many girls around. I mean, you could probably count on the fingers if, if not one, two hands, the amount of girls that there were in the paddock full stop. There were, there were very few, very few women. There was a lovely lady called Anne Bradshaw, who was at the time the press officer for the Williams team, who, who was like Auntie Anne, took me under her wing and, you know, and, and helped me out and um, sort of looked after me and pointed me in the right direction for things. And uh, And I was kind of not purposefully standoffish with the team, but I think, you know, I was, I was in my early twenties. I was walking into a, there was one other girl on the team who was on the catering side of things. So I was walking into a garage and I, and I was the only woman and I, I wasn't purposefully standoffish, but because I wasn't based at the factory at the time, I didn't know them on a social level. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I didn't try and make friends with them all. I, I tried to establish myself as there to do a job. Don't mess with me. I'm, not taking any shit. I'm I'm here to work because I wanted to impress my boss Tony back at the office, and I wanted to make sure that the boss of the team with, was happy with the job that I was doing. So they were kind of a you know I forgot about them, and and I and I think over time they kind of thought okay she you know a she doesn't look like she wants to be messed with, and she's taller than half of us, and and b you know I got the banter going rather than, yeah. and I think possibly I, I think possibly back then. Um, you know, you, there weren't any girly girls around, you know, maybe we were a little bit more, I want to be one of the lads because I want to be taken seriously kind of thing, yeah. which isn't necessarily right. But if, but as I say, I was a tomboy anyway, so it, it didn't really matter. Yeah. You know, I've never been a girly girl. I've never done pink. So, so I was quite happy and I love the environment. I love the the cars and the noise and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and as I said earlier, you know, I, I had a, like, I'm staying here till, you know, I'm not, I'm not a clock watcher. So they could see I was putting in the hours, doing the job, dealing with everything that they were dealing with. Didn't have any, I need this, I need that. I need somebody to carry my suitcase. I probably went the other way. I'm only now learning that somebody says, can I carry that for you? The polite answer is to say, yes, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Rather than saying, I'm perfectly carrying people carry my own suitcase, you know, which, which would have been my attitude back then. Yeah. I'm the same. I can do it. And then I'll struggle. And I'm like, I'm still no. doing it. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to carry yours as well? I can do two at the same time. <laughs> Left. Okay. I coach. <laughs> definitely but it's nice to hear that you held your own but um I wanted to ask actually everybody has the best and worst career moment I'm sure that you've got uh loads of stories but could you give us an example of some stories that showcase your biggest achievement and maybe like a monumental lesson that gave you something to Oh, oh goodness I've definitely learned from that I'm never going to do that again I, I think you're always going to have those oh my god moment when you're doing live tv yeah there's a lot going on what people sometimes don't realize is you've got a lot going on in your ears you've got directors talking you've got you know producers talking there's a lot of chat going on not all of which is relevant to you sometimes and so there's a lot of distractions it's a noisy environment um I'm not making excuses here. I'm just explaining it. And sometimes you just come out with a stupid question where you ask it in a stupid, and you, I've learned, you just have to let those things go because, you know, yeah. yeah, people may comment on it, but really a week later, they've, they've forgotten all about it. So I've had numerous, you know, foot in mouth moments, calling people by the wrong name is a speciality of mine. I've never been that good at names. And, but I, I think worst moment was really my entire first year, you know, that, that just thinking, oh, I'm not very good at this. I'm, you know, just feeling like I wasn't 
as good as I wanted to be, basically. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that was that that was that was tough doing my learning in public. In terms of the the good moments, I, I, I can remember actually my very first race with ITV. One of the first interviews I did on the grid before the race was with Eddie Irvine. Now I'd worked with Eddie again; he'd been one of my drivers whilst I was the press officer at Jordan, so I knew him well. Um, and I he was racing with Ferrari. Yeah, he would have been with Ferrari at the time. So, and he was in true Irvine style, kind of slouched down by the pit wall. Um, and I thought, if I ask him to stand up, he's just going to give me grief. So I just sat down beside him because it was easier than having the argument of asking him to stand up. After the race, my boss said, that was just fantastic because that's what we want. We don't want to be traditional. Tall. We, we want to bring a different style, a different energy. That was absolutely brilliant. I'm thinking, oh, OK, all right, I'll take that. that you don't know why that happened that way, but, but, I'll, but I'll take that. So that was a nice moment. I'd always, when I left Eddie Jordan, um, we'd, you know, we'd always said, like, I said to him, like, when you first win a race, I'm getting the interview first. If you dare give that first interview to anybody else, your life is not going to be worth living. So that was a special moment at Spa when they when they won their first Grand Prix and I elbowed my way because it was the way that the reporters worked then was far less kind of formal than it than it is now. You know, you, yeah. you had to you had to rush the drivers to get them and and there was a you know massive people around the pit wall um looking to get a word with E. I was like, I'm coming through. I'm coming through. And EJ spotted me and like so I I got the first interview. And it, that was you know a special moment just because of my relationship with EJ and with the team as well. I was as happy as anybody to see them get that that first win. And again, I remember in my first year, um, and it wasn't for good reason for the team, Damon Hill was racing at Arrows at the time. I think it was year one, could have been year two. But anyway, Damon was racing at Arrows. And I used to go in and out of all the garages then. You could, you could just wander into all of the team's garages. Again, something as a, as a reporter you, you can't do now. And I just happened to be in the arrows garage and I could just tell from the body language of everybody in there that something was was going wrong. Damon was leading the race, which at the time was an unusual situation for arrows to be in. And suddenly the energy changed in, in the garage. And I went, well, in fact, it was it was the aforementioned Anne Bradshaw, who I'd met as the Williams press officer. She was now the press officer arrow. So I said to her, Annie, what's going on? And, and, and again, it was one of those stories where she was in contact. I knew her well. I knew everybody in the garage. So they're going to, you know, so much of the work as a journalist, it's based on having those relationships, having those contacts. Annie knew I knew that something was happening. So there was no point in saying, oh, nothing, it's all fine. Um, anyway, she told me, oh, Damon's got, got a problem. Can't tell you what it is, but has got a problem. I said, well, is he, is he going to finish the race? And she said, we don't know. So I was able to call that through to, to my producer, Neil Duncanson, and say, you know, I've got, he's right, right, we're coming down to you. So they, you know, the, the commentators threw down to me and I was able to kind of break the news. And that like was a, even though it wasn't a good story, it was, for me, it was like a, you know, a stepping stone that I got the story before anybody else did. Yeah. So, which that's as a journalist is, is something you're always looking to do. Well, you're rising to the moment, I knew. And that's what I was going to ask, actually. Those moments that you pick up on your intuition and, you know, you've made networks within the paddock, which is so, so important. We were talking, uh, you know, uh, before we started recording about the importance of networking. But how do you distinguish between the trust that you have with this person, with this friend, with this individual, and then what piece of information do they give you that you can actually then publicize? How do you make that distinction? Well, the, the trust that you have with them is the key part of that because you need to maintain that trust. So sometimes people will, this is something, you know, I, I, I as you know, I now, you know, train people in in I have a media training company this is one of the things I'll talk to them about is is about there's never anything nothing is ever off the record because once you've told somebody they know about it you can never totally control where it's going but as a as a journalist and and formerly when I was a press officer I knew which people I could trust to give them more information just so they understood what was happening and then told them the line that they needed to follow in terms of so for example just off the top of my head okay I can't tell you, okay, the backstory is we've got a problem with the engine, but you can't say that because it will upset our relationship with X engine manufacturer. So the line to go with is, you know, there's an intermittent mis or oh, something, do you know what I mean? So, so you, you have to have that trust both ways. Yeah. Um, 
for me as a journalist, knowing that I'm getting the correct information, because there's nothing worse than people who try and bullshit you. It's like, honestly, do you think I came up the Liffey on a bubble? You know, I, I know. I can look into the garage and see that something's going on here. You say to some people, oh, well, well, no, nothing's wrong. You think, well, there is, you know, don't call me stupid. But yeah. maybe they feel that they don't, you know, have enough, don't know me enough, particularly these days, because I'm not in the paddock as much as I was when I was when I was full time in Formula One. But so it's about having those relationships and, and both sides knowing how far you can go, because if you as a journalist step beyond the bounds, OK, you might get the scoop for this one, but you're never going to get the story again or you're yeah. going to be you're going to go to the further down in the queue. So, you know, I think it's important to have a good working relationship on both sides from the team perspective and the media perspective so that, you know, everybody knows where the boundaries are. Yeah. I know where I can go with my broadcast. I know what I can say. I know how much I can put out there. Yes, I might sometimes have more information that's just helping me to explain the story, but I know how much of the story I, I can explain. So, um, and as I say, I think that's important on, on both sides to, to have an understanding of that. I think it's, you know, it's changed a bit nowadays because, because of the electronic media, There, the instant something is out there, wherever it may be, a million different websites around the world will pick it, can pick it up and run with it without ever going back to the source, checking the story. So, so the teams nowadays in Formula One have to be, you know, keep everything even more reined in because they just can't have information getting out, which is one of the reasons that you now have these walls of layers of, you know, communications people who are far more controlling of, of you know, the information you get, you know, what people are saying to you, which can be frustrating at times, but I also totally understand why they have to be more controlling because the tiniest little snippet, once it's out there, it, it's all around the world instantly or could be all around the world instantly. And, and the damage, the repercussions from that, if it's a wrong piece of information or it's a badly researched piece of information or somebody hasn't checked it back to source or, you know, uh, can, be, can be massive, um, both in terms of the impact, you know, on the day-to-day -day life of the team, but financially as well. There's so much money and sponsors and, you know, big business in, involved in Formula One. There are a lot of reputations that have to be managed these days. Yeah, for sure. And the thing is, it's already hard enough for people to take credible information and then cut them up into a detrimental version that they want, or be it a photo is being photoshopped and it's been, you know, uh, thrown across social media. And that can generate a lot of buzz, but most people don't know it's fake. And yeah. that's the issue with even if somebody does make a mistake intentionally or in unintentionally, then you're still putting that out there. So it's, it's very much, like you said, there's a lot of boundaries to kind of go through and processes that they have to jump through before it's uh, it's actually put out on social media. Because, yeah, they'll cling on to anything these days, aren't they? And it's so instant. So even if, like you said, you walked into the garage and for you to relay that information whilst Damon was driving, you know, you had to be strategic in the way you said it. But actually you can't do that as quickly now because it's so instantaneous. If you don't say it now in the correct way, well, it's old news, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And I did need to, to manage how I put that out. I did, well, I say manage how I put it out. I did need to know, you know, it was a big thing. I'm, I'm telling millions of people who are cheering on their British hero, who's about to win a Grand Prix with arrows, that sorry, he's not going to win a Grand Prix with arrows or chances are highly unlikely. I, he finished the race, but I think he finished second third I can't remember to be honest yeah. but he certainly didn't didn't win which he was looking like he was like he was going to do so you need to manage how you're putting that news out to people make sure you know you can't be hey guess what Damon's you know he's got a problem uh, you know you, you've got to get the tone right and I, I I'd like to think uh, you know that having worked for a team and having been on the other side of the media um I understand the, the ramifications and the impact that it can have on people you could say, you know, there's potentially a situation there where you're being too careful and protecting a team. You know, a story's a story. You've got to come out with a story. If it's there, the team might not like always like it, but, uh, you know, somebody else is going to 
have the story otherwise and and then it looks like i'm not doing my job if i'm not covering the story so you've got to get the story out there um but but my personal way of going about it everybody's different and, and sometimes it depends on the publication that you're working for as well some publications yeah. they want you know they want the more wham bam in your face banner headline kind of stuff it's, mm. it's it's never been my style anyway. So um, and and so because you started in F one, now you're more into the British Touring Car Championships. And how do you find the difference between? I know you've got a lot more experience now, but in terms of now you're still in the age of instantaneous. You know, there's tweets and there's Instagram and there's TikTok. Everything is actually being blurted out. So have you found a way of Kind of refining the way you present or, or what's the difference between where you were in f1 to where you are now it's a very, very different scenario in in formula one um any broadcaster is a small fish in a large pond whereas in the british touring car championship itv are a big fish in a small pond so you know we are the host broadcaster with the with the only broadcaster effectively i mean there will be other tv stations that will you know come along and do news pieces there's other sort of online stuff but but we are the host the broadcaster um and 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 we're part of the ecosystem within the sport so the sport and all the drivers and the teams benefit from the exposure that they get through being on free to air terrestrial TV. It's part of what enables their commercial relationships with sponsors. And, you know, if you can go to a sponsor and say, we're on free to view TV on, you know, free to air TV on ITV4 on a Sunday afternoon, that's always going to be more attractive to a potential sponsor than saying you might get a line in the local newspaper kind of thing. Mm. So, so it, it, it's, it's a very different situation. And it, it's, it's very refreshing after many years of working in Formula One. And I don't mean this to be nasty, but I, I'm kind of getting too old to stand out in the hot sun for two hours and wait for some, you know, 21 year old to come out and talk to me. It's like, I've been there and done that, you know what I mean? um, And whereas in, in, in touring cars, it's almost like we say jump and they say how high, you know, I can, uh, drivers will come out of, out of engineering briefings to do a live interview with me. I mean, and that doesn't happen F1. <laughs> no, no. I walk into the back of trucks and pull drivers out of engineering briefings to do an interview. That doesn't happen in F1. So like I say, we're a much bigger fish in a much smaller pond, yeah. which makes it just an easier, easier environment to work in. You know, we, we work very much. There is no, um, you know, there's, there's no need to have the, the interface of those, you know, layers of those nets trying to stop things getting through because the teams want stuff to get through the drivers want you know as much media exposure as they can get because that's basically bottom line what pays their wages you know it's a different yeah. scenario to 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 something like formula one where it, it's a far more complex commercial landscape it's uh you know it's a much more hand-to-mouth existence and it at, at, at any national racing series anywhere in the world the same thing would would apply um you know formula one is absolute top level it, it's like the difference between you know a, a team competing in the this might be a bad analogy because i don't like football but you know a team competing in the, in the football world cup versus you know a, a team competing in league one at national level or what that is a bad analogy because as i say i don't really a like or we understand football but you, you get my gist of things it, yeah. you know, it's, it's a different it's a different scenario so it's a much more um we, we work much more hand in hand with the teams and the drivers in british touring car championship than than is possible to do with a formula one team for so many different reasons and that you know that has changed in the years that i've been involved in in formula one that the media have got kind of further and further uh, away and less less not engaged with the teams, but there's more going on. There's just more stuff happening. The teams and the drivers don't have time to engage with the with the media yeah. um, in the same way that they did, you know, maybe 15 years ago, or that they do in 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 other championships. It's a busy, busy life for media work in in Formula One. So it's far more bang, 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 bang. You know, you're in two questions, you're out, kind of thing. Yeah. There's no standing around shooting the breeze, asking how the kids are, you know, what did you get up to last week, which is, you know, I'll just wander around and chat to all, well, under normal circumstances, I haven't been wandering around anywhere in these COVID times lately, but, um, you know, under normal circumstances, I'll, I'll go to a touring car race on a Friday, you know, Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, just wandering around, chatting to the drivers, shooting the breeze, 
stealing their biscuits from the back of the truck, you know, all of, all of that kind of stuff that. Uh, well, that's when you get most of your information, right? It's through those casual chats. And sometimes you'll have a snippet <laughs> of something important. And sometimes it's not about getting a snippet. It's just about having a working relationship with somebody so that when I do come to interview with them, then they're relaxed and they're yeah. comfortable talking to me. And they, and they, therefore, they're going to give you more and be more open with you just because they're more comfortable with you. That was a lesson I learned, actually, referring back to Eddie, sorry, Eddie um, Irvine, who I was talking about earlier on. You know, another time when he was at Ferrari, I did an interview with him. He'd had some kind of issue in the it was qualifying race whatever it must have been qualifying it had some kind of issue and he totally opened up to me about it when I asked him the question and as a journalist I was thinking oh, this is really good and as his former press officer I was thinking you shouldn't be telling me this <laughs> you're going to you anyway he I caught up with him later on he said oh, God, I got a bollocking for that so I just forgot I thought I just thought I was talking to you I forgot I you had a microphone and I was talking to ITV so and that's sort of what you're trying to cultivate with people not to try and entrap them but just to make them relaxed and, and open with you. So yeah, stopping and shooting the breeze with them, it, it's a great way to do that. Okay, so I'm gonna get a little bit more insight. Did you have a favorite boss, a favorite team or a favorite driver? <laughs> well, no, no, I can easily say this because so I've worked with, with two teams with Leighton House, the guy who was the boss of Leighton House, a guy called Ian Phillips, then became the commercial officer at Jordan. So, so, I, you know, so it was Ian Phillips and then Eddie Jordan, who I worked with most. So I had two favourite bosses, but, you know, they were both fantastic to work with. Favourite driver? No, they could all be a pain in the arse at times, you know. I mean, the only one who was never a pain in the arse was Martin Brundlick. He was just like a grown up. Suddenly I had a driver who turned up on time wearing the right gear, said the right things to all the right people, did a, it was like, oh my God, you know, it, because half the time I'd been, you know, they turn up wearing the wrong branding or be late or, you know, when you're trying to manage, just like managing small children at times, you know, so, <laughs> so um, but, but, you know, people like, I mean, Eddie, Irvine, you know, his sister is now, you know, has, has for many years been one of my best mates. Eddie is somebody who I would still see on a social level if we are, if our paths, you know, happen happen to cross people like dc you know um mark weber people who you just i built relationships with you know back when i was interviewing them but if i would now sort of call call mates um because you know we, we, we've sort of carried on having a, a sort of a friendship outside of, of that working relationship so johnny herbert he was another one a little tinker to try and interview at times um <laughs> But, but it, you know, he was just, I, I'd worked with him as a, as a, sort of as a press officer when he was with the, with the Lotus team. Again, they had, they had some camel sponsorship. So we'd, we'd done a bit of work together then. So, you know, there were, there were lots of, there was no favourite because yeah. everybody who I've just mentioned could be a total pain in the arse at times. But it's funny that you mentioned the drivers who have now turned presenters. So it's actually funny that you've created that relationship and they've ended up being presenters now for their own, either Formula One or, or you know, Sky Sports or Channel Yeah, 40, because like I, I think they were always good communicators. So uh, when you went to interview with them, they were, they were good interviewees. They, you know, they would be go-tos. I need a quote on the circuit. Hmm. And okay, it helps that they were, you know, native English speakers and... Um, so as a, as a, as a UK based broadcaster, you want somebody who speaks good English and, and, um, but, um, yeah, they, they were just all good communicators. And it's funny that you say good communication because that actually brings me to Goodman Media. So you've created a media presentation skills training for drivers, for individuals, for small groups or teams, and actually stripping that back actually why did you feel that this was an avenue you wanted to go down was it necessary as you said that there are certain people who can communicate very well there was some people that you've actually noticed while you were interviewing that oh you need to brush up on a few skills so how did it come about and was it something that you felt really passionate about I just needed the money. I needed the job. So it was, do you know what I'd always had in the back of my mind when I was working for ITV and Formula One, I was mindful of the fact that, that I, you know, I was a one trick pony and um, that I was very, 
I, there was going to come a time that would have a finite, you know, amount of um, life in it. And I was very much at the whim of, of other people. So I kept thinking, what else could I do? I really, maybe I should get something of my own going. And in fact, I was up at the, up at the NEC at the Autosport show, chatting with um, two, uh, two guys who are good mates of, of um, Jensen, Richard Williams and Chris Buncombe, who were both racing drivers who, uh, you know, JB was another guy who I always got on really well with. And I met Chris and Richie through him and they were up there and we were chatting and, and I can't remember if it was Chris or Richie said, oh, do you know anybody who does media training? And I kind of thought, that's what I could do, isn't it? That's what I could do is my own little, little thing. Of course, did nothing about it until ITV pulled the plug on their F1 contract and then thought, mm, time to set up that media training company. So, so that was really how it came about. And I just kind of thought, you know, I've, I've, I, I can see both sides. I, I understand as the poacher and the gamekeeper. I've been in the team. I understand how teams work. I understand how drivers work because I've worked behind the scenes with a lot of racing drivers. And I need, you know, I know from a team perspective, you need to approach them all in different ways to get the best out of them and, and understand their characters and personalities. And, um, and also obviously as a, as a broadcaster and, and generally working in the media, um, you know, having a good idea of the media landscape and how all of that works. And, and, I, and I just was aware of the fact that, you know, I can remember drivers like, I can remember talking with, with Damon about it when I was first setting up the company. And, you know, people from Damon's era, the Eddie Irvines, the, the Johnny Herberts, those guys, they literally went from zero exposure to media to boom, you're in Formula One. Yeah. And nobody, you know, like Damon said, nobody ever told me, nobody's ever taught me how to do an interview. I just kind of had to make it up as I went along. And, and it, you know, it's become a far more important thing now, not just for people in motorsport, but for all sports people, all, all athletes to be far more savvy on the communication side, the media, the marketing with sponsors, you know, how to, you know, deal with when sponsors have got, you know, groups of people they've got to interact with and all of this kind of thing. It's just part of your job as a professional athlete hmm. to have to do all of these, all of these things. And, you know, the, the, the higher, as a racing driver, the, the higher you get up the ladder, the less time you spend driving the car and the more time you spend on the media and the marketing and all of that side of thing. And now it's because the sport has got so much more expensive. You need to have the backing from these people. Yeah, there are some very lucky drivers who, you know, have very wealthy backgrounds and, and that helps them along their way. That's always been the way that it works. Money's always made the wheels go round. Um, but, it, but it now helps people. I think people at a younger age need to be able to find money. You know, a lot of drivers I talk with, oh, yeah, but look at Kimi Räikkönen and he's... I will point out to them that actually Kimi comes from near when you could jump from Formula Renault into Formula One. That's like going from, you know, junior categories. And you, you just, drivers don't do that now. Um, so to get up through the ranks of, you know, even national Formula Four, you're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds of budget you need yeah. to find. So there's, there's not many, you know, not very many bank and mum and dads have that much of a reserve floating around in them. So, so it's an important part of, of what they need to, to do. So, so yeah, so that's, that's when I set up the company and it's kind of grown from there. I obviously work with a lot of people in, in motorsport because that's where I'm known, but I'm also working increasingly more now with businesses, with, you know, small businesses, because um, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm very hands on when I do the training. It's very, there's a little bit of talking about stuff, but it's mostly practical. I'm filming people in different scenarios and then we play it back and we look at it and point out what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. Body language makes a massive difference. You know, it's far more impactful what your body language is saying in terms of we don't realize as, as viewers when we're watching people doing an interview we are drawing all sorts of different conclusions, but a lot of that is based on body language and how they're speaking. Most people, if you ask them after an interview what somebody has just said, they wouldn't remember it, but they'll remember the impression that they've, that they've left. So, so I think it's about giving, um, giving the drivers or the team people more of an understanding of what's going on around them. Racing drivers tend to be control freaks. It's part of their makeup. And if they feel out of control, 
they're never going to perform at their best. So it's about putting them in control in the environment that they're in, understanding the environment that they're in, understanding what a journalist is trying to do mm. so that they can a, facilitate that journalist. Then therefore they become the Mark Webbers and the David Coulthards. They become the go to driver and then you're going to get more exposure for yourself that way. And therefore you're likely to be able to get more money in. Um, but also, you know, so that they can understand so they can protect themselves as well. They 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 know what traps journalists might try and, and get them into. They so as yeah, it's about putting them in the driving seat of interviews rather than just being a passenger and going wherever the interviewer wants to take them. And as I say, more and more now I'm working with people in, in the business world as well, just with with um, you know, small, um, small organizations, you know, quite a few startups. I mean, I've worked with some, you know, big multinationals, um, but it tends to be small groups or, or individuals that I'm that I'm working with because I that's just the way I like working. I like it being hands on. I like being able to get inside people's heads as well and, and help them, give them confidence because so much of it about performing well is, is about confidence, understanding the environment you're in and having the confidence that actually you can, you can deal with it. And also I think for the sports people, you know, it's very much, I know people have the idea that media training, it's, you know, it's all about making driver's little PR. The last thing I as a journalist want is some boring, bland little PR machine. It's about giving them the confidence to get their personalities across because that's what we connect with. That's what's going to make yeah. driver A more popular than driver B is their personality. And once they're listening to you, once you've got them engaged, then you can subtly slide in the commercial references. And again, I'll teach them how to do that in a subtle, subtle way rather than the sort of, you know, end of an interview and I want to thank sponsor a sponsor b and you know because we just switch off when we hear that so yeah so that's that's kind of what i do and, and now i do it and i love doing it as well i i didn't yeah. it, sometimes it's it's hard work if you've got somebody who you know sometimes you'll find uh, you know you're working for an, an organization like i remember the fia taking me out to um i went out to hungary with my cameraman and did some training um with the fia international drivers so and, you know, you, you'll sometimes get one who just like, oh, I'm not going to. And then it's hard work because you've got to, you know, keep people engaged the whole way through. Mm -hmm. Stop them interrupting everybody else who does want to learn. And but and that's a that's very rare. I think most drivers these days, you know, they want to learn because mm -hmm. they know how important it is. It is for them. I can remember many years back, um, I used to work with the. Um, World Series by Renault drivers. So it will be an international field. They come over for the British round of the championship. Afterwards, they would go to the, to the as was Renault factory at, at Enstone and they'd spend time with engineers and I come and do something. So you've got a big group and it was quite tricky to manage that because you've got to keep, as you know, racing drivers have a short attention span. You've got to keep them engaged the whole way through. But I can remember there were two, I was expecting the drivers all to go and sit at the back of the, you know, back of the cinema kind of thing. But there are a few of them who came, sat right down at the front, and they were Daniel Ricciardo, Jean Eric Byrne, you know, drivers who've gone on to have successful careers in motorsport. And you find, I find you can, I can spot a driver who's going to do well because they're asking questions, they want to learn, yeah. not just about the media, they're adopting that attitude in every area rather than, and you do see, you know, some of the some of the drivers in the junior formulae who are kind of living somebody else's dream um you know dad it's normally dad likes the idea of their son being a racing driver enjoys yeah. going to the races kid really isn't you know and they're never going to succeed it it's so tough you've got to be 120 percent committed across the board yeah if you if you want to succeed you know the, the likes of Lewis Hamilton, Lando Norris, you know, they've dedicated their entire life to, to motorsport, as have many other drivers, you know, who haven't made it to the Giddy Heights of Formula One, but are racing in, in British Touring Car Championship or in GT, British GT or WEC or whatever it might be. You know, if you want to succeed, it's a very, very, very competitive business. So you've just got to put the effort in across the board, maximum effort in across the board. It's that like mindset of a champion, isn't it? It's you're not just a good driver, but you're you're honing in all of these skills and these requirements across the board. And that's you basically you're hit that nail. You're a sponge. Yeah. yeah, for I sure. I think that on the physical side of things, you know, the drivers who are prepared to, 
go the extra mile, you know, till they throw up at the end of a training session. That's, you know, that it, it, it's that commitment that you want to see from people because, because if they're not prepared to put in that commitment, you know, they're not going to succeed quite frankly, because there'll be somebody else who is, and yeah. it might even be a driver who has less talent than them. Um, but if it's a driver who's more committed across the board, you know, there's, there's many, there's a few drivers I've worked with actually, who, who, who have, gone up through the ranks on their laurels because they are exceptional drivers but then they get to a certain point and they stick hmm. because you know and and there was one driver who who was you know racing internationally in single seaters and he just he he was a brilliant talent on the track but he was too lazy to put in the effort off the track and in all the other areas and and he eventually got shunted sideways and that's when he came to see me because he said I realize now what I've been doing wrong and I, you know, I'd walk into sponsor events and I was like, oh, I don't need to do this, this is boring. And, you know, he said yeah. he'd gone into a, he was, by this time, he'd sort of moved sideways into GT racing and, and he walked in um, and there was a driver who, um, a driver called Darren Turner, who coincidentally was, I'd worked with at Jordan. Darren was a little lad, a 17 year old working in sub, sorry, in the machine shop at Jordan who used to sleep in the factory to save money on that he could spend on a set of tires rather than, you know, getting a B and B. So, um, and Darren has had a very long and successful career as a as a racing driver, long term Aston Martin Martin Works driver. And this other guy said he saw Darren come in and just light up the room with all these sponsors and or guests and thought, okay, that's what the people who are paying his wages want from him. That's why I'm struggling to get somebody who's going to pay my wages yeah I don't give that so yeah not just about what happens on track and and you're not just ha enhancing communications to the media you're enhancing their communication overall right so that communication could then be enhanced with their own team principal or even you know contract negotiations talking to their engineers you're actually enhancing that level of clarity and communication yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't, I don't think I could claim to help them in the contract negotiations, but, but I have had, and particularly, you know, particularly some of the younger drivers sort of racing in, in national series, you know, I've had parents say to me, she or he isn't good enough to be a professional racing driver. It's highly unlikely it's going to happen, but this is a really good life skill for them. A really good life skill. Yeah. You know, and I, 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 I work every year, well, under normal circumstances, I haven't been able to do the last couple of years, with Stowe School. Um, and they have a history bursary. So some students get to apply for a bursary, they go traveling, and then they come back and they make a presentation on a historical, you know, about the history of the place that they've been, whatever the topic was that they, they chose to do. And I was brought in a, a few, well, it's probably a decade ago now, to, to coach them to help them make these presentations, which is just to the rest of the sixth form and their parents and, and teachers. Um, and the guy who brought me in, he said, you know, it, 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 I can see the difference it's made just in terms of their confidence when they go in there. They need that when they're going for a university interview. They yeah. need that, you know, and I've, I even I coached one of my goddaughters when she was going for her university interview, <sighs> just so that she could make an impact when she walked into the room. And, yeah. you know, it is a life skill that in a very competitive working world, you need more and more these days to just to be able to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you said that you learned that in your very first year as a Formula One presenter, like getting that confidence and, you know, doing it in front of everyone, but actually pushing yourself forward with grit determination and you know that confidence I think that confidence definitely can either showcase on camera if you're not and um and it can make you shine when you are I feel anyway um, the trick is, and this, this is my top tip this is where the body language comes in because your body language very often gives away how you're feeling so if you know that even if you're not feeling confident you can look confident mm. and then nobody knows that you're not feeling confident I like the, that. The message that they take away is, oh, she looks confident, doesn't she? Look at the way she's standing, as opposed to, you know, that, which is sort of non-confident body language. So, so as yeah. I say, you can, we give away how we're feeling inside by, by how, you know, we manifest it through our body language. So if you know that, you can turn it around. You can be absolutely quaking inside. But if you walk up to the rostrum to make a presentation, take a deep breath, look everybody in the eye, you know, it's like, oh, she knows what she's doing. I'll relax. She, she, this is going to be fine. As opposed to somebody, you know, walking up to make a presentation and shuffling with their notes. And, and then the whole audience says, oh, God, 
this week. Yeah. So, and it's funny because we, as coaches, I remember early doors in my career, we would have a look at our posture. Are we in, on the gym floor? Is our posture just correct? Exactly. <laughs> no, you would want to be coached by a coach who's slouching or leaning on a piece of kit. It's like our posture should be erect. It should be, you know, uh, confident. We, yeah. we, we know where our assets are and how we're actually positioning ourselves, but also we should be looking after ourselves in a training way anyway. And it's just like, we are our own advertisement. So yeah, like, You're the product. So exactly. You've got to, you know, you've exactly. Got to, you've got to yeah. And so I'm really glad that you talked about giving a few snippets. So actually the, the big question now is for any young presenters who, or even young speakers, who wanted to do um, enhance their knowledge, enhance their skills, but obviously they, they couldn't go into Goodman Media and, and get your advice there. So what can somebody do if they wanted to go into the world of presenting or even just, you know, have a little bit more confidence in speaking up in a presentation, for example, because there's apparently a lot more fears around speaking in public than there are any other fears in the world, like even fear of spiders. Apparently, public speaking is the highest. So yeah, there, there was an off use quote. I don't know who came out with it originally, but people are more frightened of speaking in public than they are of dying, which means that they'd rather be in the coffin at a funeral than standing up at the pulpit delivering the eulogy. So insane. Um, That's insane. Uh, it is. It's madness. Uh, you know, I, I, it, but I always say to people, butterflies are a good thing. Butterflies heighten a performance. So as an athlete, you want those butterflies. As a driver, you want that thing. You've just got to keep the butterflies flying in the same direction. It's when they start going off in different directions, when it gets out of control, that those nerves overtake. And so actually it's the, you know, the same way that, that, that an actor will feel the nerves when they go on stage. You just have to use that energy rather than let that energy use you and, and overtake you. So in terms of my, t I, I think for, for a presenter, for a, um, or a reporter, you, you, and in fact, standing up and making a presentation as well, know your topic, know your subject. There's nothing worse than, a, you know, and as I said earlier on, of course, I've asked some daft questions at times, but I think as a, as a reporter, or as a presenter, people see through if you don't know what you're talking about. And if you look at an area like motorsport um, or any sport, um, people are passionate about it. Same as if you're in the arts or ballet or whatever it might be your audience is drawn to your topic because they're interested in it. So you've got to have an interest in it as well to ask the kind of questions that they will want to hear. And that's another thing is know who your audience is as well, yeah. because, you know, that will, um, that will allow you to present things in a way that they will understand. So this is something going back to my training. I'll, you know, I'll say but when you're doing an interview, if you are talking to a motorsport audience, tell them about your turn and understeer. They'll understand what you're talking about. If you're doing an interview with your, with your local TV station, you start talking about turn and understeer. People will switch off. It'll go over the top of their head. So you've got to know your audience and know what your, your audience's level of understanding is. Exactly the same thing applies to a presentation. You, you've got to be targeting it at your audience rather than above their head or, or beneath them. So, um, so know your topic and know your audience. I think of the... The main things that I would say to people um, when it comes to presenting either on television or, you know, in an auditorium or because that in itself will give you the confidence. And when you've got that confidence, um, you know, I, I know I will. Everybody works in slightly different ways. But before I go off to any race, I'll prep. I'll make loads of notes. Chances are I never look at the notes but it gives me the confidence that I know my stuff. Yeah. Um, so, and when you, you know, when you've got that confidence, if you do need to free form, particularly when you're doing live television, stuff happens, you know, not when it's supposed to, you, you have got to make stuff up as you go along to a large extent. So, but you're making it up from a, from a basis of solid knowledge of, of what's going on. So um, yeah, I think knowing, know your stuff first and foremost, there's no point trying to get into, anything motorsport whatever it might be uh, as a reporter or a presenter if you don't know what you're talking about that's not to say you can't learn I can remember when um BBC took over the coverage of, of Formula One 
Jake Humphrey turned up in the paddock. Never had anything to do with motorsport, but yeah. I say that, you know, he, he'd obviously had a bit of an interest in it, but boy, he'd done his homework. You know, he's a, he's a constant, he's one of those really annoying people who's just bloody good at what they do. Absolute consummate professional, you know, he's just sickening, makes it look so easy, so easy. Um, but, you know, so you can learn. Um, mm. You've got to have a passion for what you're talking about because that will come through as well. If you're just looking at it as a means to an end, if you're just thinking, oh, I'm just going to do this because it might lead on to something better, that, that comes across, I think, when you're working yeah. as, a, as a presenter or as a, as a reporter. Um, and, and yeah, the same thing if you're, you know, if, you, if you're trying to, if you're making a presentation in a, any kind of public environment, you've got to have a passion for what you're talking about because otherwise, why should anybody listening to you be interested in what you've got to say if you're yeah. and yes and some of that will come from the way you put it across you can you can make something really quite boring sound totally fascinating if you present it in a fascinating and, and engaged in an animated way conversely you could be saying something absolutely amazing but if you're saying it in a really dull voice and you know with no animation no way people people are not going to engage with what you're saying so um but I, but i think yeah having having that that passion for what you're talking about makes a makes a big difference as well yeah, I, I, th I read somewhere from a, a renowned speaker actually said, when you're presenting, can you inspire, can you engage and can you educate? And I really, really liked those because I'm trying to become a better presenter. And, you know, I'm doing a lot of virtual conferences at the moment and speaking that way. And I'm still constantly learning, like, how can I improve my communication skills, the coherence of my message and yeah, and, 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 and hit those three targets that he said. So I'm really, really glad that you said, you know, the engagement and knowing your audience is so, so important. It's so important. So yeah. important. People forget about the end user. And ultimately, as a, as a journalist, I'm a mouthpiece getting information out to the end, to the end user. So yeah. I love that. Always know your goal as well. So if your goal is to get the audience engaged and to give them knowledge, well, you are like you said, that, that microphone. But also have a, have a knowledge of what they want to hear. Mm. You need to, when I'm talking at a driver at the end of the road, my job is to ask the question that everybody sitting at home wants to know the answer to. So yeah. I've kind of got, got to second guess that to, to a certain, like, you know, but it's about having, a, knowing where the story is. Yeah. Um, following the story, because that's what everybody wants at the end of the day. We love stories. It's like we, we grow up listening to stories. We never lose that love of stories. And, and I think that's another key thing when, you know, when you're when you are speaking, when you particularly when you're making a presentation, bring things to life through stories. And that's yeah. always going to make people sit up and, and listen a bit more rather than just punching hard facts at them. You need to bring bring these things to life and as I say that very often happens by by way of story. Well I think you've been awesome so far in this podcast but we've heard so many good stories from you already so I can tell like how much experience you've gathered within F1 and now with British Touring Cars and and you know with Goodman Media it's just been so so good to speak to you about all of these things. So we normally end our podcast with a, cute, a few quick fires and I know you're a bookworm. So I'm so, so happy that you're a bookworm. And one of the questions is, I didn't want to whistle it down to one book. So do you have three favorite books? I've had a good think about this. I have okay. my three favorite books written down here in no particular order. A book I loved, I bought for so many people for Christmas was Shantaram by uh gregory david roberts have you not read it haven't <gasps> love it absolutely talk about stories it's an amazing story you um to summarize it's so like a a man who theoretically speaking is a horrible man an australian who has a criminal record and is a drug addict disappears goes to india escapes from prison goes to live in india lives in the, the slums in in mumbai kind of hiding away and then proceeds to have this incredible, and not all of it in a good way, you know, he, he does a lot of shady stuff, and um, but just fascinating. And it's 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 a effectively a true story. I say it's a true story, but it's based on a true story, but so and you're kind of thinking this bloke's horrible, but I'm really quite falling for him, you know. It's it's he's such an engaging character, such an engaging story. So I love Shantaram. I can highly recommend that. Okay. I, I loved as a as a youngster, I uh, you know, when I was at school, um, you know, you get like set texts that you have to do. And for my one of my O-level books was Tess of the Durbervilles, which 
which I love. I love Thomas Hardy anyway, but I, I kind of went for Tess of the D'Urbervilles. It's just one of those books that I read in those, you know, formative years that, um, yeah, just really stuck with me, really sort of, sort of resonated with me. Nice. And then my third one is a book called A Scandalous Life, which is the biography of Lady Jane Digby, who um, was born in the early 1800s. She was the, the daughter of uh, the Earl of somewhere, born in Norfolk. So a very, you know, aristocratic lady who lived an outrageous life. She had four husbands. She had affairs left, right and centre, children left, right and centre, travel. And she ended up the wife of a Bedouin, um, you know, a, Be a Bedouin living in, in Syria. Um, for, so she just had this most amazing. I love the fact that she was really naughty. I love the fact that she did what she wanted to do. And I love the fact that she traveled a lot because I love traveling. So I just kind of think, oh, my God, she was some top bird, wasn't she? Again, possibly not a nice person, but wow, what a fascinating character. So that would be my third one. A oh, great. Well, so I've written them all down. I am going to put them on my book list because I love the fact that you uh, brought in different characters. And actually, as you just said, you may not necessarily like them, but you're just following their story. And that's the engagement part of it, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. I've written them all down and are definitely on my bucket list. But also, now that you mentioned, because you love traveling, obviously we've talked about your career today. If you could be anything else, <laughs> if there was another career that you could pick for yourself, what would you do? Do you know, I've never picked a career. I, I often say to people, I'm still waiting to find out what I want to do when I grow up. Seriously, I, when I was young, I wanted to be a doctor. Then I started doing physics and chemistry and very rapidly went off that idea. So... I've I've never I've my entire career has been a, a kind of a set of happy circumstance. I've sort of fallen from not fallen <coughs> opportunity. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Opportunities have presented themselves. I guess I had to have the the skills to to do the job. And um, but I but I've never sat down and made a career choice other than setting up my media training company. So. I think the only other thing I find people fascinating, I would possibly quite like to have, you know, done something along the sort of psychiatry or or counselling or something along those lines, because I do find find people really endlessly fascinating and I quite like listening to people's problems as well. So <laughs> so maybe maybe something like that. So still uh, communications, but in a different way. <laughs> Um, yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, yeah, perhaps. Because yeah. listening is communication, isn't it? It's just you're actually listening to what they're saying and absorbing it and taking it in. So getting inside their heads. I find mm -hmm. that's one of the interesting things about the work I do now is you know getting inside people's heads and finding out where their buttons are so that you know which ones you need to push because every, everyone's different. Yeah. Some people you need to you know, and you'll have seen this with racing drivers. Some of them you need to slap. Some of them you need to cuddle they're going to respond in different ways so for sure it's building that own relationship isn't it and as you alluded to it earlier it's that trust it's building trust with people yeah. and, and every single person is different when it comes to that I find the same thing with coaching that you have to build that rapport and the communication and then you draw out that willingness to train you need to work out which avenue to take to get the best out of people and it's of going course. to be a different road, a slightly different road for everybody Okay, so a bit of an anomaly. What would, you, what would you do, your favourite thing to do outside of work, when you're not working? Uh, what, what I really want to do, and I don't get to do it, well, I particularly don't get to do it that much at the moment. I love travelling. I love to, I did a lot of travel when I was younger. I, I sort of had my round the world tour, um, you know, when I was in my early 20s it was actually my 21st birthday present for my parents was around the world ticket Aww. so I love traveling I love discovering new places so it would it would in an ideal world when we can just going to all of the different places I'd like to go to that I haven't been I, I play this little game with myself of trying to have been to as many countries as I have years of age and I, I think I'm a couple behind now so I need to you know get on that plane again sorry I know it's not very me and my oh, yeah. cousin have done the same thing. It was me and my brother and my cousin. We're all the same. We love traveling. I think I got it from my parents. 
and uh, we've done the same thing. We were trying to bucket list every country and just say how close are we are to our age, and so we yeah. got to catch up too. <laughs> yeah. so I'm only a couple behind, so I'm doing quite well. So long term traveling, but I think just short term, I love. I've got, I've got, you can't see it, but I've got my little Springer Spaniel curled up on the floor down there. I'm lucky enough to live in a, in a lovely little village in Oxfordshire. And, and to be honest, you know, the frenetic lifestyle that I live, just the opportunity to, you know, go for a walk and that sounds really boring, doesn't it? Or go to the pub, you know, I've got lucky to have two dog friendly pubs in my village. So just, just kind of relaxing and catching up with people. And I've developed like a little bit of an old person's passion for gardening as well. I got, that was my lockdown, my lockdown, um, entertainment was I, I got slightly obsessed with building things out of pallets so I built a few, a few veg beds and, and tables and all sorts of bits and bobs I, I like a bit of DIY you know, I'm a bit of a bit of a bob the, in fact, I'm known as Bob the Builder by a couple of girl mates in the village who are like call me up Louise I need got some curtains need putting up or something so um so yeah just pottering around in the garden walking with the dog and a couple of mates around the lovely walks around here and then hitting the pub brilliant Nice classic British day then, <laughs> as long as the weather's good, right? <laughs> yeah, makes a difference, makes a big difference. And our last question that we ask every guest is, if you were to recommend one person to come on the guest and you would want to hear from, who would that be? Oh, um, you've thrown me there when you say who you would want to hear from, because I was thinking of people that I listen to and are... Um, and are really funny to listen to. And the person I was going to say, just because I think what you get is very different to what the perception is, is Steve Ryder, who, ah. Steve Ryder's sports presenter, who I've worked with, is, is the lead presenter on the British Touring Car Championship. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it comes across slightly in BTCC, but, you know, prior to that, you have no idea how funny that man is. He is absolutely, he's, he's got such a dry humour. Steve and I kind of host the, the, the Touring Car Awards ceremony every year. I do the interviews on stage. Steve does the sort of the main press bit. And Steve, every year, he arrives for the rehearsal, saying, oh, you got any funny story? Oh, I needed to make a bit of a speech, don't I? I need to do a... You know, we do our rehearsal. He goes off upstairs, comes back down, you know, an hour later and just does 20 minutes of, honestly, I, I, I took a friend along a few years ago. She said, I would pay to watch this as stand up. Oh. He's just so funny, so dry, rips into people. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of insider jokes going on, but so the Steve Ryder, ultimate professional, you know, he's another Jake Humphreys. He, he, Steve is just so good at what he does. It's sickening. Um, but he is just, you don't always see that wicked sense of humour that he has. He's just the funniest person. He has just such a deadpan delivery. So I hear of him, obviously, at the awards ceremony every year. He's, he is the highlight of the awards ceremony every year. But I've heard him speak at, you know, car clubs. He came along as a, I'm, I'm the vice president of the Southern Car Club. Um, and we have an annual awards ceremony every year. And Steve came along as our guest speaker for that one year. And, and he's just just has a room in accent stitches so i think he's it's such a surprise to people who expect a very straight professional when they see this mischievous hysterical side of, of steve Ryder. and his presentation skills come across that way right he he's he's quite organized and analytical and then you know you've got the things in front of him but he doesn't come across as as funny as you just quite rightly said. Seeing it because he's fitting into his audience. So, you know, if you're presenting yeah. the Olympics, you can't be cracking jokes. <laughs> if, if, you know, if you're presenting the British Touring Car Championship, which is a smaller audience and it's a, and it's a kind of a more cliquey audience, you know, if you're going to turn into BTCC, you, you kind of, you want something different. You want mm. some insider jokes. You want some insider information. And, and you know, he, he regularly rips into uh, Paul O'Neill, who's one of our other uh, presenters. Paul O'Neill is currently appearing on Gogglebox with his far better known sister, Mel C, um, on <laughs> Celebrity Gogglebox. But um, Paul is kind of our whipping boy uh, in our in our writing. Everyone has room. one in the group, right? <laughs> because he, you know, it's, it's like water for ducks back. He gives as good <laughs> as he gets. But Steve, he and Steve have great banter going on. Steve with his, you know, very, very professional, drops these lines in and... Uh, all he's like Liverpool, so he's a bit more like, you know, our lad, our male this. So uh, the dynamic between the two is, is fantastic. So, yeah, they're very pretty. Brilliant. Fun. Awesome. Well, I'm going you know, to probably get your details off offline now but thank you so much for actually taking time to speak with me and 
just being such a pleasure to speak to you and hear about all of your experience. <laughs> My, well, my pleasure. Thank you for, for inviting me along. <laughs> it's great to speak with you. I'll chat to you soon. See you soon.